In this video, I'm going to discuss hydrostatic pressure. Additional videos and references can be found at svainvent.com. When you're dealing with a infinitely small fluid element or particle, the pressure is the same at all sides of the particle, which you can see in this diagram over here. Notice that the pressure on this side is canceled out by the pressure on this side, and the pressure on the top is canceled out by the pressure on the bottom. Now when you're dealing with hydrostatic pressure, the pressure on the plane that interacts with the particle will equal zero due to what I just discussed over here. However, the pressure on the z-axis, which is going up and down, is based off of the fluid depth and the fluid specific weight. This fluid depth can also be considered fluid head. To solve for the hydrostatic pressure of an incompressible fluid, you would use this equation over here where your pressure 1 equals your specific weight times the height of the fluid or the fluid head plus any pressure that was already there. Here I have an example of, of how to solve a problem dealing with an incompressible fluid. What is the absolute pressure and gauge pressure in a lake at a depth of 400 meters? The density of water equals 999 kilograms per meter cubed. To do that, I need to first solve for my specific weight, which equals 999 kilograms per meter cubed times the gravitational constant of 9.81 meters per second squared. And this will equal out to 9800 newtons per meter cubed. Now that I know what my specific weight is, I can solve for my absolute pressure, which will be the specific weight of 9,800 newtons per meter cubed times the depth of 400 meters divided by 10 to the third to transform this result into kilopascals plus the atmospheric pressure, considering the 400 meters is not including the atmospheric pressure and this will equal 4,021 kilopascal. Now to solve for the gauge pressure, you can either just solve for this part of the equation, or if you've already solved for your absolute pressure, you can subtract the atmospheric pressure from the absolute pressure, which will give you a gauge pressure of 3,920 kilopascal. Now when you're dealing with the hydrostatic pressure of a compressible fluid, you have to use the ideal gas law. When you're using the ideal gas law, you should consider it an isothermal process to make the problem simpler. Basically by considering it an isothermal process, you are saying that the temperature is constant despite any pressure change or density change. Here I have an example of how to solve a problem when you are dealing with a compressible fluid. The Empire State Building is 1,453 feet tall. If the temperature is the same at the base of the Empire State Building and the top of it, what is the pressure ratio between the top and bottom of the Empire State Building? if the temperature is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So to solve for the pressure ratio, you would take the exponential of negative g times z2 minus z1 divided by r t naught, where g is your gravitational constant of 32.2 feet per second squared. z2 minus z1 is the height of the Empire State Building, which is 1,453 feet. R is your gas constant, which you can look up in a table. And your temperature 
has to be an absolute temperature since you're dealing with the ideal gas law. So it will be 80 plus 460 to convert the temperature to Rankine. And once you have solved this equation, you will have a pressure ratio of 0.95. Now, when you're dealing with hydrostatic pressure, you're not always going to be just considering a small point. You may be considering an area. Here, I show how to solve for the hydrostatic force on a plane. To solve for the hydrostatic force on a plane, you would have to use the following equations, where your resultant force will equal the density times HC, which is the height based off of the surface, to the halfway point of the plane of interest, times the area, which is basically the area of the plane of interest that touches the fluid. Now, you may notice in this diagram you have a YC and a YR. The YC and YR are to take in consideration of planes that have their own coordinate system that does not relate to the surface of the fluid. And to solve for the X resultant and the Y resultant, which is where your FR will be located, you would use the following equations over here. Now you should know that you don't always have to calculate the X resultant location due to the fact that some shapes have symmetry, which means that you can automatically assume that the X resultant location will be directly in the center of that particular shape. Here I have an example of how to solve for the hydrostatic force on a plane. A circular gate is used to control the water level in a reservoir. The diameter of the circular gate is 6 feet. If the water level is currently 50 feet off of the gate's centroid, what is the resultant force on the gate from that hydrostatic pressure? And where is this force located? The density of water is 1.94 slugs per foot cubed. To solve for this problem, you need to determine what your specific weight is, and that will be 1.94 times 32.2, which will equal 62.5 pounds per foot cubed. The area of water that is touching the gate will be pi 3 foot cubed, which will equal 28.3 foot cubed, and HC will equal YC, since the gate shares the same plane as the water, and that will be 50 feet. So to solve for your resultant force, you would take your specific weight times your HC times your area, and that will equal 88.4 times 10 to the third pounds. And to solve for the Y resultant location, you'll have to determine what the moment of inertia is, which is pi 3 foot raised to the 4th divided by 4, which will equal 63.6 foot to the 4th. And then plugging that into your Y resultant equation, you will get a Y resultant location of 50.04 feet based off of the surface of the fluid. Now you also may have to deal with a curved surface. The simplest way to explain how to solve this problem is to create a free body diagram. You're going to have a combination of the weight of the water, which is force 1, above the curved surface plus the weight of the water was in the curved surface. You'll have the hydrostatic force going in the horizontal direction, which is represented by F2, 
and this is counteracted by your horizontal force. And then once you have your horizontal force and your vertical force, you can solve for the resultant force, which will equal the square root of your horizontal force squared plus your vertical force squared. Here I have an example of how to solve for the hydrostatic force on a curved surface. The bottom of a pool has a 0.5 meter radius along its edge. What is the resultant force per meter of the curved surface? The density of water equals 999 kilograms per meter cubed. So to solve for this problem, you need to determine what your specific weight is, and that's 9800 newtons per meter cubed. Your HC value will be half of this radius plus 4.5, and that will equal 4.75 meters. The area that the water touches will be based off of the plane in this direction, which will be 0.5 times the 1 meter increment, and that will equal 0.5 meters. And your total volume of water, which is this section that my mouse is tracing out, will equal 2.45 meters cubed. So your vertical force will be your specific weight times this total volume of water, which will equal 23.97 kilonewtons. And your horizontal force will be the hydrostatic pressure, which equals your specific weight times HC times the area, which equals 23.3 kilonewtons. So your resultant force will then equal the square root of your horizontal force squared plus your vertical force squared, which will equal 33.4 kilonewtons. That concludes this video. The next video will be about manometers.